Hello everyone, it's Oliver Harper here and I'm back with Rob Hill for another audio commentary and this time it's on The Terminator. Rob has covered the movie and its extensive knockoffs on his channel and we felt it was time for us to explore our thoughts on the movie together. So Rob, are you excited to talk about this 1984 masterpiece? Always, always man. <laughs> I presume doing your extensive sort of research of all the knockoffs you kind of built up a, a wealth of knowledge on the 84 movie so... Yeah, but then you know what it's like that that that's all gone out of your mind by like the midway point of the following project. But <laughs> I, I have spent a few hours kind of rediscovering my not my love for the movie that never goes anywhere. But yeah, the the the, the knowledge of its darker corners. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. So, folks, you can enjoy this podcast by itself, but if you wish to sync up this audio commentary with your own copy of the film, put the timestamp to zero on your Blu-ray or NTSC DVD and press play. Now, now for me, uh, the Terminator was something I saw after Terminator Two, because it was like, obviously as a kid I wasn't aware of this franchise. T Two had come out, it came out on video. The video games were about all the toys and stuff. I was of that age where really impressionable, so I just wanted everything on the Terminator. And um, my friend, my friend's dad had recorded the Terminator off TV from the eighties, and he had it in one of those. Um, like, do you remember those cases for VHS? It was like a book. Yeah, oh yeah. It, it, yeah. It was book clamshell things. Yeah. It like, it's like Peter K took the piss out of. You've been doing a lot of reading. Oh no, it's a VHS. <laughs> you know? He had it in one of those things. And um, as a kid, I, I obviously enjoyed this film a lot. I was all about T2 because of the action and craziness. Yeah. But as an adult, I just found myself kind of veering towards the Terminator as the best of the franchise. That is exactly my experience as well, yeah. I, d I didn't, I mean, I'm, I'm a couple of years older than you, so I was aware yeah. of the Terminator, not not it coming out, I'm not quite that old, but I was aware of my friends watching it, but at the time I was a bit more, I think I was a bit of a Schwarzenegger snob, I preferred Stallone. Oh, but right. by the time Terminator 2 came out, when I must have been 14 or something, it... That just blew me away, obviously. Completely blew me away. And I went back to the original Terminator and I liked it fine. But, uh, yeah, like you say, over the last sort of five years, each time I've gone back to either one, I've, mm. I mean, this has just become absolutely my favourite of the two now, the original. Yeah, I just love the darkness, the bleakness to it. It's, you know, the the we only see the the world of the, of, of the future and you use small little amounts, but it's that's horrifying. It's got that, I think reading up on sort of James Cameron's vision for it was this kind of like taking ideas from World War Two to sort of the, the photos and film of like Berlin mm. and it's all being destroyed and you've got this kind of the story with Skynet kind of rounding up all these people either to be kind of killed off or used as slaves it's very much of that sort of holocaust yeah. uh, event you know I think that's what he, he, he told Michael Bean to look into as well for inspiration for his character wasn't it, it was holocaust related because he's got all the markings, doesn't he? The sort of you know been printed on, so you're being yeah. barcoded, you know. Um, but this, you know, again, Brad Fidel's kind of opening music is so good. I, mm. I love because um, for years, obviously, this film that came out in '84, they didn't a small budget and they didn't make use of Dolby Stereo, so it was put out as a mono kind of mono track, and um, that was kind of used throughout the years and on Laserdisc and DVD. Then they kind of remastered the movie in the, in the mid 2000s, I believe. Uh, the big 5.1 mix and people are still kind of a little bit irritated because they changed some of the sound effects yeah. in the film um, not as, nowhere near as egregious as well what they did with Superman when that got a special edition in the early 2000s and if anyone who's bought the 4k of Batman the 1989 film they've updated all the sound effects in that so it sounds modern and it sounds really weird so if you've not heard that, Rob, then I'll oh, check it out. It will, no. it will, you'll be like, this sounds bizarre. That, that will <laughs> really wind me up, actually. Yeah, so thanks for that tip and suggestion. <laughs> it pre-warned. Um, but yeah, it's... it's And obviously there's, there's also the colour changes over the years with the film. It's like a little bit more teal and stuff. Yeah. But, um, not as bad as some of the um, other remasters we've seen. I do, I do, yeah, it's a peculiar habit, isn't it? This some, It's not just directors, it's often distributors. They just can't leave B, can they? And it's, I mean, fine, it, was, it, was, it, had, it had mono sound, I believe. I, I read somewhere, anyway, Cameron saying he basically had a choice between this special effect or recording sound in stereo, <laughs> and he went for the special <laughs> effect. So you could argue you that, you know, maybe it wasn't intended to be mono, it just had to be, but... It's how we experienced it. It's how we know it. And 
change what you want, but you know, don't don't obliterate the original. Don't Lucas it. Exactly. I always love the the chunky lightning we see in the Terminator. I think like Fantasy Two effects. You know, sort of that, those sort of we've seen that lightning used in other films that they've done effects on, and um, I just love the sort of arrival of the Terminator. And it's yeah. like, as we all know, I think as Terminator fans, we've all gone into this thing, uh, kind of knowing obviously some of the backstory of this, where James Cameron was obviously working on, it maybe come to the end of working on Piranha Two in Rome, and he got uh, a really bad case of the flu, and uh, he was having some mad feverish dreams, and he sort of come up with the idea of the Terminator with this kind of, you know, it's crawling out of this fire, with holding a knife, I think it was. Yeah, I think there was this vision where yeah, it was a fever dream vision, he always, but I love that term, a fever dream vision of this, yeah. yeah, metal torso crawling towards him with kitchen knives in its fists, and yeah, he rang up Gail Ann Hurd straight away and described <laughs> it and said, right, this is the movie we're going to make. It was like he, it's like he, he thought he was going to die. The fever was so harsh, yeah. and uh, he was kind of. And the producer at the time had had stopped his per diem, so he couldn't. He didn't have any money. Yeah, he, yeah, he wasn't even meant to be there. He'd spent his own money on the flight over. He'd been sacked from the movie months earlier, and he'd spent his own money to fly over to Rome to to basically force his way into the editing room and. Didn't he break in or something? Like to sort of, he changed a few scenes overnight. Yeah, apparently every night for for a matter of days, if not weeks, he he was breaking in and change. And it's, I've never quite understood that because what did is, is Olivia G. Asinitis, wasn't it? The somewhat um, grey area, slightly dodgy producer who who'd taken control because that was his plan from the start. Was the deal he had was he it had to have an American name as the director, so he had to hire Cameron to direct it. But he'd always planned to kick him off. And oh, right. how he was not noticing these changes being made at night is something I've never quite understood. <laughs> also, we've got some great little cameos here of like people that will become massive stars with Bill Paxton and um, the other gentleman who plays the villain in Cobra. I can't uh, Brian name. Thompson. Brian yeah. Thompson, yes, the guy with the almighty jaw. Yeah, oh, a real old favourite of mine, thanks to AWOL, uh, one we've talked about before, yeah. and also The X-Files. So he's great, and, and he's, he's actually great in a bunch of movies. There's a there's a great movie called Hired to Kill, oh, which is a, it's a very it's a low budget B movie. It's a very, it's just a very generic late eighties actioner, and it was his kind of it's a bit like um with uh, Action Jackson, it was kind of an attempt was made to make him a star, even though he was really you know a bit of a B player. But yeah, it's a great movie that. Well, see, he was uh, Shao Kahn in Mortal Kombat Annihilation yeah. in his <laughs> most hammiest performance <laughs> of his career. Um, I do love this bit here. Where he goes, the man stole my pants. <laughs> <laughs> I always love it. And it. That's horrible. For the whole rest of the movie, I, I can never get it out of my mind that he's going commando in a tramp's trousers. Oh, man. Piss stained trousers. <laughs> you know, he just stink. Entire film. So the, the sex scene as well. It's like, oh, it makes my skin crawl. He's come straight <laughs> from a future with no running water. He's already <laughs> sweaty and filthy at this point. He's been living off rats. You know. <laughs> <laughs> About to put his tramp's clothes on and she has sex with him. But he does He does pick up some of the best trainers. You know, yeah, it's true. Yeah. Like, which uh, a number of my friends always wanted to get hold of. They get a great money shot as well, don't they? I don't know if Nike or... Was it Nike? I can't remember. I don't know if they paid yeah, for that. Nike. Or... Yeah, it's Nike. They must have done it. If you see a product yeah. shot that clear, they've, yeah. they've you know, learned to get a bit of extra cash. Because Cameron was... Um, you know, his dad, I think, had flown him back or gave him some money to him to fly back from Rome to America. And oh. I think he was, like, travelling around, I think Cameron was, and uh, he had, basically had no money at all. And um, it's also started forming a script. And I think it was only until 1982 that he that Arnold got to read it. Mm. So it's, there was a... Also, we had delays with this because due to Arnold committing to the sequel to Conan... Yeah, that was the... That was, was the, the big... Destroyer, Conan the Destroyer, yeah. It was... Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, oh god, what's his name? That uh, I think there was a bit of a personal feud going on. It was a bit of a, a bit of leverage. Dino, uh, Dino De Laurentiis, that's, yeah, yeah. Because they were originally planning on, I believe, anyway, planning on shooting Conan the Destroyer the following year. But when word of Arnie being in demand for this came up, De Laurentiis mm-hmm. apparently sort of played his card. And well, they were supposed to do a Terminator. Well, no, sorry, they were supposed to do a, a Conan film every other year. Um, so it was supposed oh. to be like a Bond series, you know oh, what I mean? Really? Like Arnold would do a Conan film for Dino and then so forth, but that never transpired. I was always mm-hmm. disappointed that um, John Milius didn't really continue that or Oliver Stone 
writing sort of Conan sequels. Um, he's there's a bit there when he, he confronted the cop and he goes, "What year?" Yeah. You know, in the trailer, it's a different voice. Obviously, they ADR'd the guy. Is it really in the film? Um, which sounds totally different because that that little exchange there is one of the that's one of the key sort of meme like nuggets that are, that live in my head. That mm. the the intonation and the dynamic of that little scene, it's you know, it's like. Like the Uzi 9mm or any of these funny little random <laughs> exchanges. That that one's one of the biggest for me. There's the the desperation and the importance that Michael Bean brings to that little moment. It's incredible. Oh, yeah. But it's, it's interesting that Michael Bean was only, was only in one, one movie. He was obviously he made an appearance in a, an extended scene in the special edition of T2. Um, but he's so important to it mm. you know, the franchise despite only it being in it once you know um, yeah. I think he's I think it's down to his performance has been so memorable and um, it's interesting when he was casting wasn't it and he had a uh, he cast for something else, and he had this kind of southern accent on. Yeah, yeah, he'd he been to, to a... Yeah, because he, he was a stage actor primarily at the time, wasn't he? Mm, As you yeah. say, he'd, he'd done very little on screen. And, yeah, he'd been for an audition for Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, which required him to have a, a southern accent. And apparently not deliberately, but inadvertently, he kept the accent for the audition for this, which is something he wasn't mm. really thinking very... You know, it's like, oh, I might as well bowl along to this and see what's what. He wasn't very... It was all about Cat on a Hot Tin Roof that day for him. Oh, and, yeah... yeah <laughs> Apparently Cameron rang his agent and said, he's great, but I, I don't want him to have a southern accent. Can he do Can he do just like a, a generic non-regional accent? And the, the agent's like, what the hell are you talking about? He's from Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> I do love, obviously because the, this film has a very sort of strong element of film noir to it with the yeah. sort of use of lighting and the, the camera placement. But also the, the, the sort of the city very much kind of uh, uh, as a visual element of what we see in Taxi Driver, I, I always felt a sort of that gr- it's just a grimy kind of look of the past. Yeah, it, it, and it also it, it is a character in its own right, LA, uh, just as New York is in Taxi Driver. Yeah, it, it's. I think often it's because they. This was shot guerrilla, wasn't it? Basically, they didn't really have a lot of permits and. Yeah. So and and I think that kind of encourages you to go to places that you wouldn't normally be able to go to, I guess. And yeah, or well, the fear of being caught too quickly, you know. So if you go to sort of the back streets or the questionable, um, you know, streets in this city where there's possibly a lot of crime. Yeah. Well, a lot of this is shot downtown, isn't it? Yeah, in a in a not a great area. Yeah. I think, what was it? The one film I think it was Highlander potentially. I think when they'd or well, maybe maybe this where they'd. No, it's Predator Two, where they'd find dead bodies when they were filming. Really? Yeah, just buried <laughs> under like rubbish. And I'm like, oh my Jesus god! It's crazy. No, yeah, shit your pants, kind of moment. <laughs> there is like a, a, me and Rob beforehand were talking about some of the deleted scenes from the movie, and uh, this scene in particular has one, but it's not really. Uh, I can see why it's cut. It's just when he once he shoots the lady, she goes, "Is there a gun?" And she goes, "Yes." And it's like, <laughs> boom! <laughs> she takes her out, and um, you just see him walk back into the car and disappear. But this moment here, as you were saying about permits, he didn't have a permit here, so yeah. I, I didn't have a breakaway glass. It was real glass. You had to punch through. So was it really? Yeah, apparently so. I know he had his um, he had his his street clothes in the boot of this car, didn't he? Because they had to get it, because it was, they didn't have a permit. They had to get him out of his costume the second the camera stopped <laughs> rolling. I hope it was like Hawaiian shorts or something, you know, just something completely... <laughs> it probably bonkers. wasn't. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this moment here, also a deleted scene where she looks in the in the mirror and puts on a sort of fake smile, doesn't she? Yeah. Sort of... Yeah. I, I, perfect. What perfect casting as well. She is here, Linda oh, Hamilton. Yeah. She's just my. Apparently, they. Um, I didn't realise until the other day they were after Jennifer Jason Lee originally. Really. And and she was then cast as. That's still a pretty good choice, though. Uh, yeah, I, I think like it, it's definitely a type that they had in mind. Now Cameron, he knows his stuff, doesn't he? He's, he's not. He's not short on confidence or determination in these movies. Yeah. He knows what he wants. I think. With Jennifer Jason Lee, she how is I think maybe it's down to the role she's done where she's really like a bit aggressive, you know. So I think Linda has that softer side. I yeah, think she could do. And um, I always love this moment here when he asks for like a, you know, like a uh, faced plasma rifle. Yeah, plasma <laughs> rifle. Yeah, that's what you see, pal. <laughs> you know? yeah. 
And we've got the great actor who's always been like pretty much as a cameo in every Joe Dante movie, you know. Yeah, uh, Dick... Uh, oh, Jesus, what's his bloody name? I'm my Dick, brain... Is, is it Dick Miller? Dick Miller. Yeah. My brain has had it, man. <laughs> uh, he's, he's, he's just marvellous, Dick Miller. In fact, I, I see there your Gremlins 2 t-shirt, the new batch yeah. that you're wearing. That was one of his finest moments in Gremlins 2. <laughs> Standing on the street being scared of that stop-motion <laughs> flapping Gremlin thing. He's also very good in Matinee. I always liked him in that. Mm. Yeah, and a whole bunch of old Corman movies as well. Yeah, I think he, I think he sadly passed away a couple of years ago. I mean, yeah. he was, he was getting on a bit anyway, you know. Um, I love how he thought, oh, that's so cool. Though. Cutting off, hiding the gun, perfect yeah. way. Cut off the, uh, um, what was it, the grip, I suppose. Again, it's just the intensity. Everything he does is so intense and so... Yeah, yeah. Rhythmic somehow as well. He's also plays it like a bit like a robot, doesn't he? Yeah. You know, he's very much like emotion, motionless. Sorry, and um, another, another one of my favourite moments. What the? <laughs> it's getting yeah. thrown. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, buddy, you got a serious attitude problem. <laughs> Imagine that. They had no permit for that. That wasn't an act. Yeah. You know? <laughs> James Cameron's just like, do it, just throw him. <laughs> Is there a bit of foreshadowing to sort yeah. of the, uh, the lorry at the end? Ba-dumpf. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's just so beautifully made, isn't it? So beautifully shot and framed and everything. It's uh, I mean, at, at the time because Cameron was. I think he was discussing like it says a lot of his contemporaries were doing kind of slasher movies, and he didn't want to do that. And uh, the one he sort of respected the most was John Carpenter. Because he said, oh, you know, he achieved so, so, so much for so little. Yeah. In this case with Halloween. There's a real similar, similar vibe, I think, these two movies. Hmm. For sure. I, I think Cameron was talking a lot about Hitchcock and things like that when he was kind of the writing process in terms of the elements of film noir and mm. things like that. I think you can draw a lot from this movie. There's, I mean, if you, uh, I'm sure, you know, many people have written, even for like university, sort of deep film analysis on the Terminator and you, and you can always pull something more from it um, I, w- I wonder when that um, when that um, that sort of that linear sort of relentlessness that defines this movie I wonder when that was introduced because the original concept for the Terminator as everybody knows was a, an ordinary man someone who would blend in someone who didn't look remarkable in any way and it was Obviously, it was the, the, the infamous meeting with Arnold when they, when both Arnold and cause Cameron went to meet him for lunch, didn't he? And famously, yes, the idea was that he was going to play Carl Reese, but he didn't want him playing Carl Reese because he was enormous and Carl Reese was meant to be an everyman. So he went. So Cameron went to the meeting intending to pick a fight with Arnold and fall out with him uh, because he figured <laughs> he figured that was the only way he could he could get him off the off the mm. project because the studio really wanted him Hemdale and Orion both really wanted him but they came to the conclusion then that actually Arnold wanted to play the villain anyway and the way he described his vision for for the terminator changed Cameron's mind in a lot of ways and he wasn't originally this relentless unstoppable you know li- character who'd provide this linear structure he was originally meant to be much more lithe and animal like and sort of in the shadows and so on so almost the defining element the defining characteristic of this movie it's relentlessness i i I wonder if it really came more from arnold than from cameron and Mm. and because it's obviously that relentlessness that brings you back to halloween and movies like that that that, you know the linear structure and yeah, it's especially the, the, the creative process of filmmaking. It's not just one person's vision, isn't it? And Arnold, Arnold's, you know, no one's ever accused Arnold of being stupid. You know, exactly. He's always got interesting ideas. Yeah, and um, and it, honestly, it was a massive career risk for him, wasn't it? Being yeah. a bad guy, you know, because he'd never done that. And it, and unfortunately, this is the only Arnold film where there's no like sort of grunts in it. It's just all. <laughs> it doesn't say much. It doesn't say anything really. It's just a few lines and. Uh, um, and also, as a as a fan of the franchise and the, f- the frustration that's come with the sequels, we never got to see much of this war. And maybe that's kind of a if we did get it, it wouldn't live up to expectations. Or yeah, I, I I'm okay with that. You're okay with that, yeah. 
I'm okay with that, to be honest. I, I, th- this has never been my favourite... Th- these sequences have never been my favourites in either of the proper Terminators, the, the future, right. you know, the, the glimpses we get of the future. It's about, you know, it's... it's it, again, it's a, bit, it's a bit like a bit like the mono stereo soundtrack, I guess. It, it's not set in the present because Cameron wanted to set it in the present. It's because he couldn't afford to set it in the future. Mm. But that became a part of, you know, an integral part of the movie. It's, it's, it's a contemporary set movie. Yeah. So I don't think we need to see too much more of this, personally. Mm. It does look great, though. I know. <laughs> <That's> the thing. Because <laughs> when Salvation came out, it was very much a Mad Max-looking movie. And um, it wasn't. It didn't have the blues and stuff what we'd seen, and the laser guns, you know. And um, but I think that was supposed to be like another set of trilogy. Then they would explore what we'd see in this later on. But yeah. it was still like ah, oh, just again, it's slightly out of our grasp, you know, having that. But I also this moment here because it's like he's he's having a flashback, but he looks like he's about to die. Yeah. <laughs> Did John Connor <laughs> save him at the last second? I don't know. I do love that sort of contrast of the past and the future with the machines, you know, just this wonderful sort of visual storytelling going on. Yeah, I think a lot of that comes from, or maybe comes from, that nine-month period they had to wait. I, I've seen Gail and Hurd and James Cameron, Gail and Hurd, who produced and co-wrote, um, mm. they've both talked about how that gap not only gave Cameron, of course, the time to write Aliens, um, yeah. but gave them the chance to, to come up with all these little touches and all the, the, all these little bits of depth and all the bits of added value that, you know, a cheap B-movie doesn't normally have. No, it doesn't. You know, as, as, as we've seen with, um, you know, also your great video where you explore the knockoffs, you know, we see, because they don't have the time or they just kind of saw this as a sort of the, the basis for their own movie and just basically rip it off. You know, in a very quick succession, you know, uh, you see there's not much creativity involved. Exactly. You know, um, aside from amazing casting of, say, Mark Hamill, you know, from the future. Yeah. <laughs> and what film was that again? I can't remember now. Oh, God, I've forgotten as well. Yeah. <laughs> but it, yeah, it's exactly the same plot, except it's it's not a robot. <laughs> it's Mark Hamill. <laughs> Now he's he's from uh, Top Gun, who would appear in Top Gun, wouldn't he? Oh, um, yes, I'd never clicked that. Yeah, yeah, he's um, he's one where, where uh, Maverick Tom Cruise goes up to him and goes, "Man, you stink." Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah. I think it might be Slider. Is it Slider? I can't remember the name. I love how I love how the dynamic here between the the sergeant and um, yeah, I've been one of the detectives. I don't know uh, Lance Henriksen's Henriksen's role in this. Uh, we just like he just goes on about this horrible shit this guy's done. He's just like shut up, you know. It's just like he just seems to get off on it, doesn't he? Um, but also, yeah, because we were mentioning about you know a potential casting of um, Arnold and what we before obviously. I know. I know. There was trivia about O.J. Simpson being considered. Yeah. yeah, I think that's some of the most famous trivia about this movie is who was originally considered to play the Terminator, was it? And and yeah, yeah. I I don't know what what the truth is, but yeah, there apparently, um, allegedly, uh, both Mel Gibson and Sylvester Stallone were offered um, the role as well. But, uh, so, no, sorry, they were offered Reese, not 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 the Terminator. But yeah, O.J. Simpson was apparently considered, but deemed too nice. Which is kind of ironic <laughs> when you think about it, um, and I think the, the most famous one is Lance Henriksen, isn't it? Who was legend goes he was he was cast. You know, he he had a he he he'd built his costume. He'd started um, running about the back streets of L.A. at night, like practicing being a you know a spider like um, sort of creepy crawly type uh, of Terminator. Which well, was... didn't he go into like the casting call or someone's office and he freaked out the staff? And so, had... so I think this is where this is where that legend, either that legend grew from, or where the fake legend grew from. I don't know which is true, but I am inclined to believe that Lance Henriksen wasn't actually ever considered for the Terminator. It wasn't believed. It, it, it wasn't planned anyway. But um, because he was friends with Cameron, um, them having made Piranha 2 together, um, Cameron recruited him to kind of freak out the Hemdale executives, or it may have been Orion, at a meeting when they were when he was pitching his idea. You know, he hadn't yet got the job, so he had Henriksen in full makeup and outfit 
turn up and sort of sit in the waiting room at, at the at the production company and just scare the hell out of people. And then he brought him into the meeting halfway through the meeting for kind of for the effect. And you know, I have no idea whether that's whether that's true or not. But I, I, I'm kind of inclined to believe it because it's, yeah. a, it's an odd rumor to not be true. And I don't think Cameron or Henriksen have actually disputed it. Well, Hen- Henriksen probably wouldn't because it's like it's in his favour. But you know, to sort of show that he was potentially considered. And there's artwork. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and again, the artwork is allegedly that artwork, the famous image of Henriksen half fate. Apparently, that was a conceptual. It was all part of the same thing. Henriksen was helping Cameron conceptualise and and come up with these ideas. I mean, the uh, on. Um... Cameron's artworks featured in the trailer, you know, the teaser for Terminator, where he's got he's he's drawn Arnold, you know, yeah. it's incredible stuff. And then I think for the UK poster, potentially some European trailer uh, posters, they would uh, sort of do a, a kind of a copy of that, um, where some of the posters it's actually Arnold as like a photo of him posing with other two Uzis, all these guys yeah. like pointing one way or whatever. And then there's one where it's like a hand drawn kind of design, but it's not actually, um, you know, James Cameron's artwork, just a artist interpretation and amusingly that artworks either I've, I've never actually looked to see whether it's been copied or whether it's literally just a photo copy of it but that's appeared on a bunch of knockoff movies as well mm. the uh terminator 2 the italian movie called terminator 2 uses exactly that image on the cover and it's clearly arnold's face it's kind of really taking the piss well it's one isn't it there's other b movies but there's like robocop on the front cover robocop has nothing to do with the movie you know, yeah. Um, so there's loads of kind of yeah. bogus ones kicking around. I love how he like, give me a cigarette. He's already got one in his hand. You know. <laughs> you know, this was the character, the woman uh, who Jennifer Jason Lee was apparently uh, eventually cast to play, having been considered for Sarah Connor. And then, uh, literally, apparently, the day before shooting, she uh, she t- took a better job, basically. And this this whoever this girl, I can't remember her name now, but was cast in place. It's interesting that um, the box office wise, you know, it made like close to eighty million dollars worldwide, which was huge numbers. Considering you think about inflation and stuff, now. Mm. Um but Cameron said he was frustrated with Orion because they didn't really do much work yeah. on promoting it because this was successful based on word of mouth. Yeah. So it was at number one spot for three weeks. I've know. got some minor insider knowledge on this as well because um, when this uh, was set for release in the UK, my dad was working in a, uh advertising agency in London. Oh, right. He actually went to a screening of this with a couple of other people because they'd been approached to do the marketing for mm. its UK release. And he said, num- number one, uh, my dad is not into this kind of movie at all. If it's, right. you know, if it's not a 1950s war movie, it's, it's not really going to fly. <laughs> if there's no yeah. Alec Guinness, he's not interested. But he said, he, he, for, number one, he couldn't understand any of it. He had no idea what it was about. And, so, and number two, he said they, they were ju- what they wanted to do for the money they were offering was ridiculous. He said, it, they, they, just w- they just had no money and wouldn't pay. They weren't interested in spending anything on promoting it in the UK, basically. That's bizarre. It is, it's strange, isn't it? Because there's a gap between the US and UK theatrical, and it's seen the results of... Exactly, and, and that's when... I mean, I mean that that really does highlight the ridiculousness of it because C- Cameron says the same thing. He'd originally been furious that they weren't pushing it, but then once it had been out for a couple of weeks and was, mm. you know, clearly landing, it was clearly hitting home. He went back to Hemdale and Orion and had another huge fight with them because even at that point they uh, Orion refused to put any money in. And I, I think Hemdale eventually Hemdale who produced it and um, Orion who distributed it. I think Hemdale originally uh, then decided to put in a little bit more money and that kind of forced Orion to do the same, but it wasn't much, I believe. It's fascinating, isn't it? Like They're just being absolute cheapskates, basically more than happy to take in the, mo- the box office the large amounts exactly. of money, but surely spending a little bit more to get more, because this film could have made over $100 million easily yeah, exactly. if they'd actually advertised it more. And it's, if you see the TV spots for it, the... the um, 
there's like there's like two of them I've seen where one where it's like oh it's out in cinemas and then one they did a couple of weeks later was like the n- number one movie uh, in America you know sort of that was the only thing visible what they did extra was put out another TV spot you know uh, Gail and Hurd's theory was that um, Orion were a bit embarrassed they were into the prestige movies they wanted to be associated with right I can't remember what they was it, it was maybe it was Amadeus or something like that was their big thing at the time and they just weren't interested in this this was just meant to be a bit like Nightmare on Elm Street was to New Line a bit it's just like a, a, a guilty secret stroke cash cow well I suppose Friday the 13th is the Paramount isn't it yeah yeah actually yeah that's a better example yeah much better this is more of a canon movie it could be exactly yeah yeah I suppose he didn't actually pro- approach a canon actually um I think I've got a feeling they did because the big the big um, hang up when trying to make the deal was uh, Cameron insisted on directing it himself, didn't he? So mm. again, Gail Ann Hurd, who was shopping it around, um, said she went to pretty much every production oh. company in LA, and they they a lot of them were interested, but none of them would take Cameron on. Right. I, I do love this moment here <laughs> when the um, the guy wakes up and says, like, "Whoa!" He's about to get punched, you know. <laughs> I love the detail as well. Obviously, Cameron has painted him as, you know, a slob and a, a you know, or whatever. You know, not the nicest, best guy in the world. And I just love the the framing of that shot with his after they've had sex and showing you that he's still wearing his socks and his feet are right there in the front of the frame. <laughs> yeah. No girls like sleeping with a guy with socks on. The, uh, I, I love this bit. Make a belt out of you. <laughs> the iguana, whatever it is. Making the biggest sandwiches. <laughs> it's a great introduction. It's, it's all quiet, you know, and you get a little bit of the sort of sting of music when he goes to punch him. <laughs> this shows you how, like, how strong the Terminator is, you know. The guy has no clue he's fighting a massive, like, <laughs> robot, you know. And imagine how much different this would have been if he did look like a robot, which was originally, you know, the well, potentially on the cards. Well, Cameron was always disappointed, wasn't he? I think reading, like, he loved Westworld and uh, Yul Brenner's performance as the android. But once he saw the face, the, op- the inner workings, it was just like capacitors or whatever, or like, you know, just like a, I suppose that the sort of the idea of future tech it was like the inner workings of it. it just seemed a bit dated. It didn't seem interesting where mm. with his vision, it was just like this kind of clean metal of a skeleton. Yeah. And, and uh, it was, I suppose that like you can see how things move within it, like a steam piston kind of things to it. And, uh, and it's all powered by this chip. You know, and this kind of, I suppose, power core in the middle of its chest. Um, but it was this kind of a massive leap in what you people had perceived mm. as a robot. You know, I think he was he was pushed, wasn't he, to to use a, a C three PO type, uh, you know, a, a man in a man in a suit. But decided he preferred the idea of it being the other way round, of it being it's jolly cheaper as well. Like, yeah, well, exactly. Have have yeah. Sort of, it's a stupid <laughs> outfit, you know. Well, so, you know, you could look at. Two years later, with or three years later, with Robocop, where you got a guy in a suit, but mm. it's the the difficulty of Peter Weller trying to move in that suit brought out the amazing performance. Yeah. Where he had to move in a very kind of bird like way, where Arnold t- showing the Terminator to be everything's very slow and smooth. It's like a yeah, his head's like a tripod, you know, sort of you know observing everything, you know. And ironically, they'd considered um, Schwarzenegger, hadn't they, for the for Robocop. Yeah. But came to the conclusion obviously he was far too big by the time they pasted the panels onto him it wouldn't Yeah. And and that's... Well, even like even Christopher Reeve was considered. That's mad, isn't oh, really? it? Because uh, in uh, the recent Robodoc it shows you who they'd considered and who they'd maybe I think um inquired with, yeah. you know, and Christopher Reeve was very much on there. Um But we, uh, Robocop you really just need someone with a great jaw. Yeah, and lip. good big lips, yeah. <laughs> big ass lips. Ro- Robocop <laughs> needs Peter Weller. I, I, that's that's it. You know. Indisputable, I think. And here's, here's a trivia nugget which I'd, I'd never realised until the other day. This scene features 
the only shot in the movie in which Michael Bean and Arnold Schwarzenegger are, are, are in the same frame. Yes. And I'd never You're... thought about that, but yeah, they're just... They're never in the same... If they are in the same scene, then Bean's generally in a different shot running away from him. <laughs> when he grabs that guy's hand, it's like... <laughs> it's like it's taken out. But I, I do... It's my favourite little moment, because my friend... Um, we loved the album at the time, the pop songs for it. And Burning in the Third Degree is like the greatest song in the movie. <laughs> and it's this moment where, you know, obviously, where she is, I love this moment here because she ducks and the term as he, as he walks past and the music sort of goes, this kind of weird, great reverb, you know, around the, in the sound mix. And then you see this guy kind of do this cheesy 80s dancing. Something that Eddie Murphy would take the piss out of white people dancing. <laughs> yeah, in, like, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, let's stick with this one. <laughs> I just love this shot of Bean. You yeah. see, the music, the music's tricking you as well. It's queuing up that he could be the bad guy. Yeah, and you Brilliant. could, you could not. I, mean, I know I've, I've got to be in my bonnet about digital cinematography, but that shot mm. of Bean would mm. never work with a digital camera. It would never be as powerful, never be as effective mm. if it was. No matter what lens you use, no matter what camera you use, I just don't believe. It could ever look that grimy and textured, and no, it would just look too clean. That's the problem, with digital. Yeah. But I mean, they, they you can do loads of you know effects now to make things yeah, look yeah, like fake grain, yeah. and it never quite looks right. But you, you also, I, I still don't believe you get, um, you get a very satisfying kind of contrast from from digital cameras. I, yeah, I don't think you get the the same sort of detail in the in the blacks. Oh, love that shot. Boom, boom. And I, it's a great moment here which shows you how good like Carl is at sort of movement because he's like he's so quick as well as he tries to he avoids all the you know oozy blast, jumps over the bar. <laughs> and it's Arnold as well, like the way he turns his head. Yeah. Super sharp. And then uh when he's firing the gun, he's like Rrr! and then he sort of you know, as he uh Shoots that person, he pulls up the Uzi and just walks towards camera. I mean, I think it's just like it's so it's just precise. Yeah, it's like it, a machine. It's a without. Pre- it's a know. really precise performance as well. Mm. And it, I love this as well because we're seeing him now much more dynamic than he's been. You know, he's moving much more quickly. He's although he's he's doing essentially he's doing a really good performance of an emotionless thing displaying a small amount of emotion, which is yeah kind of concern and because up until now he figures this is going to be an easy job suddenly everything's gone wrong and there's someone someone in play he doesn't know yeah. about and and it's changed his performance but it's changed it in a way that's believable for a, for a robot if that makes sense for sure for sure I said earlier on how you know, with the, with the second film was always one I loved when I was a, a kid or teenager but I, I think it misses the horror mm. as element, and I think this, why this one is it works a lot more for me. But it's just a the threat of the Terminator is um, just far more compelling. Yes, yeah. um, just not to take anything away from Robert Patrick's performance, the T one thousand, because he's still he's still brilliant. Oh yeah, he he is brilliant, and it's a brilliant performance. But yeah, he's just not shot in a way that's as you know, he's just not treated by the filmmaker in a way that's as mm. unnerving as this. This scene as well is a great one because the, the score right now that um, there's a kind of mad um, keyboard thing going on, which is just it all just seems a little bit wrong. It's all a bit off cue. It's all a bit I don't know. It's it's really unnerving. This music, just sort of this kind of thing going on. Did they? They actually put acid, didn't they, in Arnold here? On his coat, yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Is that now? Is that was that? That's William Wisher, isn't it? Who co-wrote? It is, the isn't it? Yeah. Because he'd helped terminate, uh, help James, you know, structure the script, didn't he? Yeah. Um, and he obviously has a cameo number two as a photographer in the um, shopping mall. Oh, is he? As Arnold gets thrown through the glass, and then you know you see T one thousand. Look at that, that mannequin. It's all silver. And he's like, yeah. mm, looks confused and walks <laughs> off. Um, I love it because later on, because as, as the Terminator gets more damaged, he's he's losing his eyebrows. I know. So like, I, I've it's, never it's, bought that. If I'm honest, it's, if know. you if you notice as well, the, the the reason given is that he's in a there's a, a a big like load of flames that he's kind of thrown through, 
Mm. But in this shot, it the flames go nowhere near his face. He doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> it hasn't. Like why? Why is it only burnt off his eyebrows and not his hair or his coat? It says a little bit soon. It says a little bit soon, doesn't it? It's oh, I suppose. Bit, but yeah, it's it all just... been like cut. He's lost his like like boy band nineties hairdo <laughs> centre parting, which I used to have one of his haircuts as well. So I was I was had a bad haircut for like a decade. Um, yeah, it's. It... <laughs> I don't know. I've never. I've just never. I've never bought that. And intriguingly, though, Schwarzenegger was so worried about shaving off his eyebrows. Did you hear this? Apparently, he, he took. He no. ensured. He ensured them not growing back with Lloyd's of London. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it sounds like the kind of story that could have been made up, to be honest. But apparently, it can take. I remember years ago, I had like a slight eye infection, and it like took away half my eyebrow. It was weird. Really? I don't know what happened. It took ages for it to grow back. My yeah. friends were like, Ollie, what's wrong with your eyebrow? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it does happen, though, doesn't it? There are, there are actors, I can't think of any now, but there are actors who have, who have said, you know, that they, shave, they had to shave their head for a bald patch and, it, and the hair just simply never grew back the same way. Oh, my God. But it does happen. I'm surprised they didn't use some sort of prosthetic. That's what I'd always assumed. Mm. Now there was a, I don't think it's a deleted scene, I think it was part of the script where the Terminator, you see the Terminator eating like chocolate bars and things like that to sort of maintain the integrity of his flesh. Apparently, yeah, yeah, they had to consume a small amount of food. But yeah, apparently in the, he was going to be eating chocolate bars without unwrapping them, you know, wrapper and all. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Because it's... It, that's an interesting element because you know that idea was deployed with Robocop. To sort of, he has baby food to mm. maintain the, the human element of him, the flesh and uh, part of the brain, I suppose. And here we are in the midst of probably the greatest exposition scene ever filmed. Films can be uh, criticised quite heavily for having massive exposition dumps. Can it seem could can be seen as quite lazy in mm. storytelling, but it's so important. To this story, this film, yeah. it's integral because you can't. How would you, how what other way could you do it? Exactly. Yeah. There's a there's a whole lot of stuff to explain, and yeah, doing that in a, in the middle of an action scene was kind of revolutionary. I think. Because mm. you can't you can't have a tail Dumbledore moment in this, can you? <laughs> <laughs> You're really screwed if you do that. Or yeah, or sit, sitting in a diner making maps with straws, or whatever that line is from Looper about every, <laughs> every single time travel movie has that scene where. Oh. <laughs> but I mean, you ju- you just don't get better than this when it comes to having to communicate what's going on without it being boring. And it's and you had to and obviously came with Mark Goldblatt's editing where you, he slows it all down for this sequence where someone is on they're on the move but you can't delivering all this exposition you can't keep cutting too much you know you've got to keep the audience focused on that in dump of information yeah and uh, and, and and michael bean is so convincing and yeah in, in relaying this information that he's he's been told he's got to remember what to tell her like from john connor yeah and and again they they, they get most of it out of the way during the action but in order to emphasise the important bit and make sure it's all come home, they slow everything down really naturally to this point where it's quiet and calm, the camera's still, and uh, it's, I think it's brilliant. Now, what are, you, what are your thoughts on um, Harlan Ellison's kind of claims of, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, plagiarism? Yeah. Uh, Is it the soldier and the man with the glass hand, right? Yeah, well, he claims the soldier. I don't think he ever claimed yeah. the man with the glass hand if that, so yeah I think, that's what it's I think it was just some similarities wasn't it? there are, in a way there yeah. i've seen both those epi- i watched both those episodes and and a few other things he'd done actually when i was researching because i like to go into the, the the where the original movie comes from when i make a video about its rip-offs because it, you know it's it's only reasonable to you know credit these things to where they where credit is due and i think ultimately both cameron and ellison are right if if that's not a cop out, Ellison is notoriously litigious. Mm. He's notoriously difficult, and this is a, this is a movie written by James Cameron, William Wisher, and Gail Ann Hurd. It's not a movie written by Harlan Ellison. And when you watch those Out of Limits episodes that he claims uh, Cameron ripped off, the, you know it's 
it's it's plot it's a plot element here and a plot device there. There's no overarching similarity. Mm. You know, everything happens for different reasons and in profoundly different ways. And I think if if Cameron hadn't made the mistake allegedly of saying, you know, in passing to a couple of people that he was ripping off a couple of Harlan Ellison short stories. Oh, which is what Ellison built his case on when he I don't think he did take legal action. If I remember rightly, he threatened to. I don't think he actually sued yeah, Harlan anyone. said he loved the movie. Yeah. But he saw some obviously some similarities. And he said, like, if Cameron had just phoned me up yeah. and said, oh, I'm going to be inspired by these kind of stories you'd written. I'd be like, go with it. Love it. Do it. But as we know of Harlan, who's obviously passed away a couple of years ago or maybe something like that. Um he probably would have wanted some money anyway. Yeah, he, yeah he's, he said that, but he also said, he, it, there's also a great interview where he's moaning about it and he gets really angry about it. And, and he says, I don't take a piss without someone paying me. Yeah, I love that interview. It's one and of the greatest it's, it's, interviews. It's going on about cross my, cross my palm with silver. And it's like, yeah. it's like, this does not fit with his position. of. And, you know, to be fair, he probably said that. He probably said if he just asked, I'd have given it to him. That's probably part mm. of a part of his negotiating strategy. Yeah, because obviously Hemdale and Orion just sort of gave in and accepted and paid yeah. um, percentage or gave him a credit else. They, the yeah, they gave the him a video. Yeah, it, they gave him very little though, really. They gave him a really a, a non-committal credit at the end and a, a token amount, which I think is was sixty five thousand dollars. That's the most frequently mm. reported figure. But Cameron went nuts. He, he did. He, went, he yeah. was absolutely called him a parasite. He, refused to work with Orion again at one point. Uh, mm. it's, yeah, he was furious about it. Because he, he had a gagging order as well. He couldn't talk about it. Yeah, yeah. It's part For like of, maybe 20 years, something like that, but, or so, 10 years. And as a result, it's Harlan Ellison's version of the story that that has become gospel. And, yeah. you know, it's... It, it's it's a difficult one. There there are really similar ideas, and really some kind of acknowledgement probably should have been made. The idea of a, a future in which two warring parties send representatives back to the present to fight out for the future, that's Harlan Ellison's idea. And this is similar enough that maybe there should have been some sort of acknowledgement or credit or something, but... A co-writer credit, like like he was originally after, is is a ridiculous idea. That was ridiculous. Yeah, I think also, even though you're saying it was his idea about you know going back into the past to save the future, I mean, even if someone who hadn't seen those episodes probably would have formulated a similar idea anyway, because it just seems so such a logical way to tell a science fiction story about time travel. Yeah, yeah, it's a fair point. You could defend Cameron in that regard. Say, look, but, but because he said something like, "Oh, I'm just borrowing a few ideas from from the Twilight Zone" or something like that, you've kind of you've kind of shown your cards a little. Yeah, bit. I th- because yeah. he spoke. So apparently, so it's it, like it, a press interview, isn't it? Something yeah, like early on. Apparently, I, and again, um, I think Harlan Ellison is the only uh, source for this. But apparently, the editor of Starlog magazine was on set of terminator and he said so where does this idea come from and cameron jokingly said oh i've ripped off a couple of harlan ellison short stories and apparently he said something similar but again ellison's the only source for that he said something similar to a friend of his who he then fell out with and that was so i mean if even if he said that it's a joke you know and it's it's not ripping off harlan ellison really it's it's maybe developing an idea he maybe had Mm. But it's also like if that, I mean, we can go back through the archives and find a Starlog issue if it's ah, actually in yeah, it. Yeah, well, this, exactly. But so apparently, um, I read not. an interview with someone <laughs> that last year who had actually found that edition of Starlog, and they, this comment is not in it. Harlan Ellison's response to that was um, that uh, the executives at Orion pressured Starlog, uh, got wind of this being said, and pressured Starlog to remove it, which is you know, entirely believable, but who knows? Mm. I do love that reaction, sorry, with Arnold when he, as soon as he spots them, just his eyes just go really big. He does great eye searching in this movie, Arnold. (laughs) He he does it in the (laughs) Technoir scene as well. He does really good looking at stuff. Dun, dun. Oh, I just love the score. I mean, when I uh, interviewed Brad Fidel 
uh, about four or five years ago for my action documentary. We had a little chat, like off camera. No, actually, it's on camera. I've got it. I've got the clip, but we didn't use it. But I said to him that the Terminator theme, the sort of dun 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 dun, dun is the heartbeat of the Terminator, which is kind of I think Brad has said. But the sort of da 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 is is the is the human element of mm. the score, and he was like, "You're the only person who's ever said that to me." <laughs> really? You know? Yeah, he was like, "Yep," yeah. you know. And uh, I was like, "Oh, wow!" So I was like, "Extra points there, yeah. <laughs> nerd points for me." Well done, yeah. But he was um, obviously because he famously didn't do the he did one and two and did the T two three D ride the score, but he was asked back to do Terminator three. But he was only asked back to do the, the trailer music. And because the studio was like, oh, we've got the guy, you know, to do the music. But they didn't get him to compose the score. And, I, and, I, and it was very bizarre because I know, I think Mick G had asked him to come back to do Salvation. But I don't think Brad Fidel was that enthused by the film. And <laughs> discussions had basically kind of waned from that point And he didn't do it. I thought, like, damn, you know, he would have come, come back and done something. But I think actually out of all those kind of terminator sequels outside of t2 i think danny elfman's contributions are quite good for salvation um very unlike his usual work mm. um but in the deleted scenes for this movie we see uh the sergeant and lance hendrickson in the car yeah who were chasing after you know reese and stuff and um oh terminator slipped out how convenient. They've stuck that on, dedicated to say, yeah. they've stuck that on the car. Yeah, and it's different as well to the... Um, is it, is it, is it, is it supposed to be to protect and it, serve? It, and it, say, it says to protect and serve in different parts of the scene yeah, as well. Yeah, that's right, yeah. I did like it, though, actually. It's quite a little bit in Michael Bay's Transformers, the first one, when the Decepticon becomes a police car and it's called... And it, it's changed it. Instead of being to protect and serve, I think it's like to enslave and something like that, you know. <laughs> but it was very clever. Yeah, it's funny. The, the the scenes that were deleted are interesting because they're, they're there's the usual couple of bits here and there that are just a bit longer or shorter and yeah, obviously change for pacing or whatever. But most of them are related to one of two things. It's either the um the the, the original concept for the for the slightly different ending, which we'll probably get into later, and mm. um or. Uh, very very human scenes between um Reese and uh Sarah. Yeah. It's there's a lot of quite emotional stuff where there's a scene where Reese um kind of breaks down at the the beauty of the world he finds himself in and he says mm. um I was never meant to see this. Mm. And it's really quite affecting. And there's yeah. a, there's also scenes of them uh, kind of uh, doing playful stuff um in during their romantic interlude. And it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it's interesting that that's what Cameron cut. It was obviously about streamlining and making it harder and faster and not getting too much into Kyle and Sarah's relationship. Um, and, and I remember reading once, I don't know if it's true, there's only one scene in the movie where Kyle smiles. And in a in a whole bunch of the deleted ones, he's he's smiling, he's, he's laughing even. Yeah, the only smile's doing the bit where she's like, at the hotel and she throws something at him. Yes, that's it. That's the bit, yeah. 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 Now, obviously, coming up here, we've got some of the early sort of uh, reveal of the inner workings of the Terminator with Stan Winston's team doing some amazing work. And, um, you know, when he pops the eyeball out um, and he puts the shades on, looking at it now, someone who maybe hadn't seen this as a kid and and watching it as an adult, it may seem slightly kind of crude because it doesn't look exactly like Arnold. But I think if it was CG... You know, and there was a green, maybe green screen, certain elements of his face to sort of give you this kind of grotesque moment. I don't think it would work because once it's kind of like a puppet, it makes it kind of weird and creepy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, I mean, at the end of the day, he is a robot. So when he becomes slightly more mechanistic or, yeah, when it when it does become a, it, it fits, it makes sense. And he's also repairing himself, so... Yeah, it, you know it makes sense. I'm I'm happy to accept that perhaps he's had to shut down certain processes that more accurately mimic human behaviour or human movement or whatever. Or I, I, I've never had a problem with that, even though it isn't entirely believable looking all the time. 
What I felt like Lance is like, just, he just don't take any of this seriously. It's like, shut up. I <laughs> love like, these two. Yeah, they're great. <laughs> I love how the um, psychiatrist is kind of just like loving it because he's just like, you know, it's, it's brilliant, brilliant. The guy's a loon. He's like, you know. <laughs> there were everyone in the, for the psychiatrist, Lance Henriksen, all, all, the, all the policemen. Oh, I think the this... sergeant is the one, is the only one who's kind of s- slightly taken in by it all because in that deleted scene, yes. he's questioning stuff. Yeah. And then when they escape, he stops them. He didn't die. Because he gives them the gun and says, you got a protector. Yeah. Because yeah. he's totally believes it. But I think that's a. I didn't like the idea that all the cops were just killed. One survived, maybe, and it could be another person who, who um, was aware of what was going on, you know. But as the fact that, because it's such a, a tight knit story of events, all this, a major part of human existence is going to come into play later on in, in the future but this important moment is such a small piece yeah in this kind of move like it well in in the world at this time it's one small little event taking place and no one's aware of it apart from two people yeah you know and uh, others may may have questioned things but having him survive was maybe i don't know and no one who who wasn't there and didn't and obviously didn't survive but no one who wasn't actually there is mm. going to believe any of it. Is going to. Mm. It always felt frustrated for Sarah, her character, you know, the character where that no, she couldn't share the story with someone else yeah. who'd, who'd experienced it. They only, they only experience it up until getting shot. <laughs> you know. Although um, a lot of those policemen technically must survive, because there are thirty. I think I'm right in saying thirty policemen who are, and they're all seen. But then in Terminator 2, it's referred to the fact that, that, that 17 were killed, or 17 died. So yeah. the implication must be that 13 survived the survived their injuries. Because not everyone... Because everyone gets kind of shot once by the Terminator, and there's a couple of, like, he's, he's machine guns and whatever. You yeah. Know? But some, there is a, a pretty strong chance that someone would survive a lot, you know, these gunshots, you know. Um, I love these sunglasses he's got now. Yeah, yeah, it's perfectly fine for him to wear sunglasses at night because he, he can see. But for humans doing that, they look like a complete berg, you know, <laughs> bumping into things. You know, I don't. If you look like that and you're walking around LA at night, no, no one's going to question you, obviously. But you're yeah. also like, I think you get a you get a free pass. You're just an eccentric. <laughs> I love this scene as well. They're just, they're, it was Silverman, Silverman, and. Um, Lance Henriksen's character just they just, <laughs> they just don't give a shit. They're that. not taking yeah. anything seriously. I didn't build the fucking thing. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't require a shred of proof. I love it. <laughs> He's a bit Lis- John Lithgow, this, this guy, isn't he? Yeah. So, yeah, he could have could have had Lithgow in this, you know. But it would have been even more. Ha- it would have been very hammy or over the top with his performance. He plays exactly this role in in one of the Terminator ripoffs as well. I can't remember which one it is now, but oh my god, he's sort of oh my. That's, that's like <laughs> that's like starring in an unofficial Bond film, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is one of his best moments, Uncle Bean. He just talks to camera. It just gives you the brutal reality of what the Terminator will do. It's the kind of thing they write into movies just to put in the trailer. Oh, mate, yeah, it's trailer <laughs> fodder. Oh, you know, well, if I ever went back to cover the Terminator again as a sort of a new retrospective, you know, you can't not use that moment for the opening trailer, you know. Look at the collar on that shirt. That is big. That's big for even 70s. That's that's like going out to his shoulders. You know. I want that shirt. <laughs> I love how he gets like, I'll sleep on his couch, which is like the smallest couch ever. <laughs> you know. I slept on him many a time. <laughs> in, in the one place where, they, where he knows she is as well. Don't, don't move her anywhere. 
Yeah, I, I think he's yeah. It only, it's only him sort of taking it seriously out of the cops. You know, they're sort of just going along with it because it's their job. But I'm loving his tie. Actually, it looks like it's made out of <laughs> scarf material or something. <laughs> It's a pretty thick material. What's this actor's name? I can't remember. Is it Paul something? I can't place him. Oh, Luke, see? Yeah, I feel, it always, it's frustrating when I forget people's names. <laughs> <laughs> it's age, man. Oh, it's uh, Paul Winfield. Paul Winfield, of course. He's a lieutenant, yeah. A lieutenant, not a sergeant. Oh, sunglasses. They're the same ones that um, Clint Eastwood wears in one of the Dirty Harry sequels, I remember discovering. But was it one of the sequels that took, up, took place after The Terminator when it came Good out? Good question, I yeah. 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 <laughs> I think Dirty Harry's all 70s, isn't it, really? In, in the early no, 80s. no, the, yeah, the, no the, um, the sequels went right well into Yeah, the Deadpool oh, was like oh, right. 87 or something like that. Oh, okay. It's got Guns N' Roses in it. And Jim Carrey. <laughs> Jim Carrey, my God! <laughs> You know, I'd um, I've I've only seen the first Dirty Harry, which is oh really, you know, yeah yeah, I've seen the first one. Oh, it's great because Arnold said because of the famous line "I'll be back," right? Um, obviously, there's a big argument behind the scenes where I will be back. It's like great, yeah, like Arnold couldn't say it like they wouldn't say it that way. Well, I, I, Arnold's point was was very much very logical. A robot wouldn't use a contraction. Yeah, and I, I love. Yeah. He was so bright and so thoughtful on the subject. He was having that <laughs> argument with Cameron. A Terminator wouldn't say um or er, would he? No, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> you're not a machine. Um, but he, because he, I think when he'd done that, he went off and um, made a movie, then came back to America, and everyone was saying, "Say the line, what line?" You know what I mean. <laughs> It's like Bart being told to say, I, I didn't do it. Yeah, you know? I think he's... Save yeah. the line, Bart. <laughs> he's, he's basically spent the last 15 years of his career saying that line, hasn't he? Well, he, he loves he loves doing all the one-liners and telling them to the fans when they ask him. Yeah. Like, that's what I, do, I love about him. Like, some actors are just so snobbish or just like, oh, mm, yeah. something I did yeah. years ago, I'm not saying that now. No. <laughs> Someone like Bruce saying. Willis, who is, yeah, who is the exact opposite, I believe. Yeah, he got, you know, he's... Um, didn't like, you know, the fans shouting out something from Die Hard. You know? Funny enough, there was that um, amusing, or depending on your sense of humour, I thought it was quite amusing, little um, um, conversation in, was it Expendables 3? Either 2 or 3, mm -hmm. when Arnold and Bruce Willis are hiding behind something getting shot at, and Thank Arnold you. says, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'll be back, and Bruce says, you've been back enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he runs off, and Arnold just mutters yippee ki -yay, or something. Oh, number three, he didn't come back for because you know he was greedy. Of oh, course, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like you only come back for like what is it? You have to be like paid a million dollars a day or something. Yeah, greedy really lazy. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much great stuff in that um, Nick de Semien book that stole the title of your documentary. Uh, there's so much great stuff in it about about their relationship, about Willis, Stallone, and particularly Stallone and Schwarzenegger and their pettiness at the height of their rivalry. Oh, you know, I they wouldn't that. go for a meeting in someone's house without it being prearranged who would arrive first and where they'd sit <laughs> and all this kind of stuff. Oh, amazing! I'm surprised they, you know, worked together with Plan on Planet Hollywood with the if the egos were yeah, so well, that was the first time clashing, yeah, that, was, yeah that they were when that deal was put together they they had been properly at war with each other you know like really slagging each other off in in the press and so on but money money heals all wounds i guess <laughs> it does yeah and um i think at that point stallone had made a few duds so he's probably uh, his ego was a bit bruised at that point well stallone had you to know. ask to to come on board planet hollywood it was Schwarzenegger was the first one offered it and then from there they went to Willis and they both signed up and at, at that point Stallone allegedly apparently had to this is according to the guy who, who put it all together and then a couple of years later Van Damme and Seagal both, um, That's both right, asked yeah, for, for a hook up as well I remember the scoring process this Brad said he had his big kind of heroic theme at the end when you know Reese 
finds Sarah in the uh, police station escapes, but Campbell's like, no, no, get rid of that, get rid of it. Yeah. You know, watch something a little bit more kind of um, discontinuing that sort of like, you know, a Terminator theme. Going. Yeah, that was a, that was a fascinating bit of an, bit of interview with Brad Fidel. I, I've seen that somewhere down the line because he was saying that he'd never spoken to a filmmaker who, who understood music on that level and how it works in a film. Mm. But yeah, yeah, the, yeah the, the thing you do at this point, he was saying something like, is yeah, you you play um, Car- Reese's theme because mm. it's his hero. And Cameron was like, no, we don't. I don't. You know, that will that will trigger these effects in the audience, and I don't want these effects. I want them to feel this instead. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't fuck about Cameron, does he? <laughs> he no, really no. knows his stuff. I don't, I don't think I heard any sort of. Um negative things about Cameron on this production. It's only kind of aliens where things, you know, his um, grumpy side yeah. sort of appeared and his short-tempered nature and, uh, you know, dealing with the British crew. I think he was very much in control of this. And I, th- I think his only aggression we know about this is his con- constant arguments with Hemdale and yeah. Orion, you know. Um, yeah, it was, yeah, the, the aliens thing where I think his reputation was sort of built really prior to, even prior to the abyss w- was basically just a cultural thing he had to deal with british craftsmen and british tradesmen same with lucas you know had mm. the same issue but lucas was obviously not as yeah, uh, yeah exactly. vocal you know he's a bit more of a softy and he just like just bottled up all this like frustration and nearly gave himself a heart attack you know <laughs> Um, Meanwhile, Cameron just sacked everyone who pissed him off, and then <laughs> yeah. frequently had to had to bring them back on to avoid a strike. <laughs> I think the other thing with Lucas, when he like you know, nearly had a heart attack shooting Star Wars, and goes back to America to ILM when they've barely done anything, and just been smoking lots of weed, <laughs> just hide a bunch of hippies. You know? Yeah, he literally oh, went God. from went from Elstree, which was just a, full of tradesmen sitting about drinking tea, to ILM, <laughs> that was just full of effects artists sitting about smoking weed. <laughs> oh, dear. He knows, think about Lucas, though, he knows how to produce, you know. You well, this is it, done. isn't it? Yeah, I, mean, I think that he learnt later than he maybe could have done that he's not a director, he's a producer. Yeah, And he's, yeah. he's certainly not a writer, either. He's got good ideas, though, hasn't he's he? Got, he's, he's, he's got the ideas, but, you know, writing is... Um, he always need. I think he always needs assistance with, and that's what the beauty of like his wife at the time. Yeah, and, oh, and editing as well, very much needed help with editing, apparently. But Cameron's, you know, as you know, as he's. I don't think he's uh, clearly not afraid to get other people to help him. You know, in this case with like the Avatar sequels, they've got like five writers on. Yeah, we're trying to make heads or tails of this kind of like. Has this got to be three hours? It's going to be a ninety-minute movie. <laughs> but he can also do, you know, or, or, something that I think really stands out with Cameron is really obvious. He can do pretty much every job on set and in many cases, has done that job and, and often better than the person he's had to hire to do it for him. But that's the problem that it comes from, isn't it? If he can do yeah. every job, then you've got, you got to deal with unions and you can't... Like, is it some things, rules, that the ca- the director can't actually operate the camera? Oh, God, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, not, not, think, not if you're doing a, a union shoot, yeah. And, and yeah. yeah you, I know you, Luke Besson was um, Fifth Element as complications, I think, because he'd, he'd just grab the camera and start filming stuff, mm. you know. Yeah, I mean, because he he was originally a model maker, wasn't he? That's what I think. I think yes. on I think on I think he he probably did more jobs on Battle Beyond the Stars than mm. most filmmakers have done in their entire careers. He, he literally started that as a model maker and ended up as the art director. Yeah, and also a matte painter on Escape from New York. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. All all kinds of odds and sods. Oh, the nightmare of bouncing a checkbook. <laughs> God. I just hate using that. I just hate doing that. <laughs> just... I, I, fortunately, they don't have Reese go, what the hell's a checkbook? <laughs> yeah. There would, there'd be people alive now who don't know what a checkbook is. True, man. Thank you, sir, for your courage through the dark years. I can't help you with what you must do, say, except to say that the future is not the past. It's probably in the future. It's just like... Sexual favors, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> I only deal in hand jobs. <laughs> and there we are. <laughs> he's, he's, he's getting some practice in. He's good at them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he's got a really strong right arm, and he's really buff. The um, 
Uh, I, that was what really annoyed me come uh, Terminator Genesis was a complete miscasting of um, the guy who played Carl Reese. Um, Jai Courtney? Jai Courtney? Jai, oh, Jai Courtney, of course, yeah, yeah. Who arrives on the future completely buff, shredded. Mm. Like, wait, wait, wait a minute. You've, you've, you've come from the future where you've been loads of protein shakes, you know, and all this <laughs> stuff. You're supposed to be eating rats. And exactly. Like, and that weird porridge stuff he makes. I can't wait what he eats now. Because like, Carl Reese tries to attempts to make something later on, doesn't he, for food. And she's like, mmm, yummy, yeah. you know. It's in a sarcastic fashion, but yeah, but no, I mean right like... from the start, I, I love that about the the opening scenes of him when when he's half naked, he looks, you know, he, he looks emaciated and damaged and dirty. Yeah, he's been starving. That's, that's the realistic kind of what would happen in a future where you're, just, you're in rubble and you've got machines trying to kill you. What are you going to eat? You know, or result to cannibalism. And mm. Cameron probably had executives standing over his shoulder saying oh, he's a good looking chap can't we uh can't we clean him up a bit and how about we have him arrive in a nice smart suit and cameron being cameron is going to say no <laughs> but <laughs> a lot of filmmakers aren't they're gonna get pressure I, that's, like, that's a great thing because arnold just appears just kneeling down he stands up and carl weiss is kind of like his character's jumped into it and just yeah. gone and fell through out of the sky and just cracked onto the pavement which is so painful yeah you can see it in his you know, he's uh, well, even the stunt man you see just fall down onto the uh, the pavement. It looks so painful. Yeah, right from the start, he his character is scrabbling around desperately and fast, trying to solve problems. Whereas Arnold's character is complete, you know, apparently in complete control, striding from point to point, calm and collected. I love all these moments here. If you've also, your son's got a PlayStation 4 or an Xbox, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a 3, yeah. You, you, you need to get Terminator Resistance because it's basically this. Yeah. The whole game's in the future, and you can go into this kind of base, and it's exact copy, and it's, like, it's like quite expansive as well. I just, like, as a fan, being able to walk around this location was just amazing. So, okay. Oh, I might have, yeah, because he, he loves these movies. Being a profoundly irresponsible father, I introduced at least him <laughs> like last year when he was eight. <laughs> he loves Amazing. them. I mean, this is like this came out as an eighteen, right? But it got reclassified to a fifteen years later for the re-release. So it's like it's quite tame by that. Apart from you know the bit of nudity later on, yeah, and, uh, bit of blood. I don't think there's anything too inappropriate in this. Really, it's another one of these movies. We've talked about this before. I mean, these modern nowadays, this movie would, with a couple of tweaks, would be made a PG thirteen, probably. Yeah. And you do only need to make a couple of tweaks, really. Well, especially since you watch American... Is it PG-13? It's kind of a 15, isn't it? Generally, is I think, R? yeah. It's somewhere I between 12 and 15. 15 it? Yeah. yeah. It's always 13. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very much <laughs> between 12 and 13. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of middle ground, you know. But obviously it's it's that um, racing that movies are, are, are built around, isn't it? It's the American PG-13 system rather than, obviously, the BBFC system in this country, but... There's no reason why this, you know, I, 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 a child shouldn't watch this movie unless they're sensitive. Now, the, the Terminators that burst through the door are the older machines, right? The ones that are um, not very convincing. Yeah, what is it, the 700s and the 800s, I think it, I think it is, yeah. And it's re- apparently it's revealed in the novelisation that Arnold is indeed an 800. And yeah. that was bad news for Reese. I just love just um, bursting with a sort of chain gun sort of legs that gun but it's just like the, the they also use it in the trailer as well but it's one of the the best uh sh- shots in the sequence when you see the eyes mm. the red eyes as he's kind of just blasting away i think a, a part of the reason i'm not mad keen on this sequence personally is it 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 looks just like a no- it's, it's a normal set it just looks like a generic, you know, miserable future. It doesn't have that, you know. Once in our own, in in the in the present day LA scenes, the the location is just so palpably real. And do you think, like, because we're only shown snippets of it, it's like it's it's fine, it's acceptable, it's interesting, kind of to see it. But to see a whole film set like that, it can 
it lose its appeal. Oh, completely. Yeah, I mean, because yeah, you're just you're just saying you're just you're seeing just rubble and boxes and you're you're doing and, something because yeah. you can, arguably, not because mm. you should or have to. Yeah. It's it's still it's always the problem with sequels, though, isn't it? What do you exp- do? You do, the, do you make the same movie again? Do you expand on something? Do you go back in time? Do you go forward? You know, there's no. Well, could, yes, we could argue T two is essentially kind of a retread of this story. Well, yeah, I, I, T two is almost a soft reboot in a way. Yeah, and number three again follows the same premise. If I'm honest, I don't remember anything about the the, the third one. <laughs> no, it's only last year I watched it again as well. Oh really? You weren't too impressed. No, number three. No. Oh, I love this moment here. You got a dead cat in there, or what? <laughs> it's like fuck you, asshole. Now, where did he get this leather jacket from? Ooh, that's a good point. Okay, we yeah, because we only see him mug the guys at the beginning and yeah. take the clothes, but then he changes outfit. It's always referred. It's often referred to as a, a cock up, as a goof or something, but. I mean, arguably, you don't need to know. Well, actually, you, you don't need to know. We've already seen how he acquires clothes. Now, is that guy got hairier arms and back than the guy from Ninja 3 Domination? <laughs> that's that's the piece of trivia we need to know. <laughs> I love this bit here, the guy. God damn! He's like... <laughs> well, you would, though, wouldn't you? Yeah, you probably well, you would say nothing. You'd be like, well, I'm not saying anything. You know, keep keep quiet. Uh, another deleted scene where she makes a phone call to her mother, who actually she's speaking to her mother. She tells her basically just to flee, go hide somewhere, go up to the, like the go go to the cabin or something. The cabin, yeah. which you find Arnold in later on when he's he's found her location. Yeah, right? yeah, I think so. so yeah. yeah. So, uh, but yes, yeah, so that's where she, um, which she doesn't explain to her mother what's happened. Just like something's happened, you got to go, and she finds the uh, phone book and finds Cyberdyne systems the address yeah and this sort of in the deleted scenes was this kind of conveyed that they should destroy cyberdyne which was obviously the integral part of t2 and shows that cameron hadn't forgotten what that sort of subplot or what eventually would would have could have been the ending of this movie mm. yeah so yeah so in t2 the, the the of course cyberdyne have the the chip and the forearm from this terminator and it's it's that that they've built all of their technology on and yeah, that that was that was originally going to be the uh, uh, part of this one because it yeah reveals the actual factory they were in was Cyberdyne. Mm. I think that's a beautiful touch. I, I, it's not something I understood or was aware of until a couple of years ago when I started you know properly researching this movie. I had no idea oh, that was Cyberdyne. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I only found out till they did the, the the DVD special edition, which had the deleted scenes on, and it, and it showed you. Oh my god, Cyberdyne because. You know, Cameron, I don't, I, well, maybe it was revealed a long time ago in, like, you know, some article for Cine Fantastique or Starlog that this was the case, and but I hadn't read those things. So it was only, like many of us, we kind of, there's always someone's in the know who's, like, a massive fan would know this on the 90s. But for the majority, it was like, oh, okay, they've actually released this material and you can see it. And uh... and it's, it's intriguing because... Reese doesn't want to do it, does he? Reese is no. profoundly against the idea because it's not his mission and what have you. And apparently, in the in the novelization, they go into it a bit more. Reese goes into it a bit more, and he, he's concerned about changing the future in the wrong way or too much or mm. something like that. If they destroyed it, um, you know, and didn't destroy the Terminator, then. The only, the only works if they find the chip. Yeah. Because destroying it now, they're not going to do anything. Yeah. That's going to happen. It's, it's it's them being there. Yeah. That causes the problem. Not that they know that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's I mean that's the fun of of, of time travel stuff and <laughs> how things can sort of play out due to one person's actions of the yeah. past. And uh, I love how Arnold was like when he's got this new bike and he's got like. Um, he runs out of uh, ammunition with this kind of machine, the Uzi or whatever, and he pulls out this little pistol. He's like, phew, just trying to shoot. That's all he's got left, you know. Pop gun, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it, but knowing what, what we now know about the original ending, 
this obviously has a, a different meaning, this scene. So they're not making these pipe bombs to defend themselves from Arnold. They're making these pipe bombs specifically to blow up Cyberdyne's factory. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Like, they've they've, they've shot it because also you got deleted. But, yeah, that was where they were going. And uh, a slight, you know, re-edit can change... You know, the yeah. editing, the, the ending, quite drastically. Because their intention here, they've, they've, they know the address of the place they're headed. So their intention after this scene is to just go straight to Cyberdyne Blur. They're not even necessarily thinking about the Terminator now. Oh yeah, because all they're done, all they're doing is sort of just it's a waypoint to hide for a bit, then move on. Yeah, you know. Yeah, they're they're, they're stopping to build their bombs, gather their thoughts, and then continue on to Cyberdyne. It's all Sarah's fault because she phoned her mother again. Idiot. Technically, in the original edit, and not in this now the first time. Has he had Sarah's a... hair. Linda Hamilton's hair is so big in this movie, isn't it? It's just so boom. I remember I couldn't believe she was the same actress when I was a kid, and Terminator Two came out. She just seemed to look so different. Oh well, yeah, she's proper ripped, isn't she? Yeah. You know, she worked out a lot, but she still has big hair. If you see the premiere of T two, big oh, hair. Oh, really? She's got yeah. She she, she didn't lose that. <laughs> so was she with Cameron at the time of T two? I think I think it was. I think they'd. I think him and Gail Ann Hurd had. I think there was maybe issues on the abyss. No, maybe? I knew they split. I, I think they'd split up prior to the abyss, but continued to work together on it. Okay. Um, but yeah, as Cameron, as we all know, Cameron likes his women who are strong, independent yeah, women. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, so it's funny how much that mirrors, g- given how he was inspired by Halloween. It's it's funny how it, it, his relationships kind of mirror John Carpenter's in that they got their first movies together with their girlfriends, partners who were kind of yes. producer writers, Deborah Hill, and, yeah, and then made their name and then immediately copped off with their leading lady. <laughs> <laughs> but people always forget about Gaylan Hurd, how she was integral to these movies. And I, Yeah, I think she's one of the most underrated people in, in 80s Hollywood. She was absolutely vital to this movie, to Terminator 2 as well. Yeah. And, and Alien, sorry, yeah. Yeah, and keeping Cameron in order and, you know, making sure that, you know... He got what he wanted, but you know, but in <laughs> trying to keep the budget, you know, and dealing with the crew as well, who apparently yeah. hated her more than Cameron. Mm, mm, yeah, well, it's that time, isn't it? Old crotchety old men don't like being told uh, to, what to do by a woman. Yeah, especially yeah, yeah a, a firm and confident woman. Mm. But no, she went on to she's produced some great films. But obviously, she's very much behind um, The Walking Dead. Oh, show, she? She? So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, she's she's a major player in my mind. See, he just he looks exactly like he should look, doesn't he? Is mm. oh for sure, but he hasn't had a bath yet. Or no, <laughs> he's got a stink. He, at some at some stages, he has had a shave though, because if you notice his stubble. Uh, is it completely different lengths and different scenes with no rhyme or reason. <laughs> the BO was unbearable. So it, <laughs> given there's no running water in the future, he's he's never had a shower, that man, arguably, probably. No, no, not at all. And he's had no sort of wet wipes to sort of <laughs> <laughs> clean himself. It's just like, yeah. That always reminds me of that... Um, there's a bit in, I think it's Family Guy, when uh, <laughs> they're talking about what it was like having, you know, historical sex and how, how nasty sex must have been before tissues were invented and <laughs> tap water and stuff. <laughs> oh, dear. I think this was this sex scene was kind of voted as one of the cheesiest sex scenes. Yeah. Yeah, it was the holding the hands bit. It's always been just like, you know, it slows it down, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a that's a break. It's also his first. It's also Reese's first time, apparently. So he, he, he wouldn't, point, he wouldn't yeah. have lasted long. <laughs> I thought that as well. Put that a minute. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've never quite believed the smile on her face here. 
<laughs> See, he's smiling. There we go. Yeah, he's happy because he's um, he's cleared the pipes. <laughs> that's all a bit of foreshadowing as well. That dogs don't like dogs can detect. And that's actually, I think that's actually, is it Cameron's or? Yeah, I think it's Cameron's actual dog. What was it? Yeah, it's either Cameron or Arnold. I think it was Cameron. I think it might have been Cameron's here. Yeah. Oh, the music here. <laughs> dun, dun. I love that. I love this bit here, the music. It's such a great yeah. piece of the score. Oh. It's that it's that same sort of wild keyboard thing. It reminds me mm. a bit of um, it's like a drum, a drum machine, electronic drum machine. That yeah, drum, yeah. Drum, it's, yeah it's, it's some it's a drum a, loop sort of it's thing. It's a yeah. particular back in the day that it would have been a very particular yeah piece of kit that made it. I'm sure, but it reminds me a bit of um, Mr. Bungle. <laughs> what, Mr. Bungle. There's yeah, a Mr. Yeah, Bungle yeah. tune where they do exactly the same kind of like wild up and down the scale kind of. Slightly unhinged. Hmm. I remember because uh, Brad Fidel said, you know, at the time with soundtrack releases, you'd have basically all it would be on vinyl and cassette tape. Um, side side A would be the score, or maybe the pop music, and then the alternative side would be the you know the rest of the music. Right. So you never get the full score; you always get half and half because they want to sell the album really on pop music. Hence why they licensed quite a few tracks or had some specifically done for the film um and uh obviously the soundtrack got put on cd later on and then they did a remaster which he was not happy with like the mixing of it so he did his own remix like about three years ago uh which is incredible it's worth getting hold of it's a yes the scores never sounded so good yeah it, it drives everything doesn't it and it the editing just works so well with whenever there's music prominent too. Oh yeah, I mean even even the score to T two is incredible. I don't think it's dated at all. No, T2. Like yeah, the, theme, the main theme just still sounds it, like yeah. Unlike this one, it's kind of timeless, isn't it? Because this does sound dated if I, to me. It sounds of its time, you know what I mean. But like the main theme for this, I don't, I wouldn't say would be like oh that sounds old and crap. But you got the. Because the rest of the score, it's very minimal in what it's doing. It's just there to set the mood and da dun da dun da dun sort of beat going through it. Um, so it's more the sort of frantic moments where you get um, this kind of crazy, kind of like elaborate um, sort of... Well, it's not really elaborate. It's kind of just more kind of, as you were saying, commenting on the sort of the, the craziness of it all. And uh... Yeah, I suppose it's probably oh, the production rather than the actual <clears throat> writing of mm. the music, if you know what I mean. Yeah, mm. that's dated. It's great here when it's like um, when they where they they've shot by the body go under the way the team the terminator gets up. You see that you see half his face. You see the metal and the red eye, and he gets hit by the truck. Do you know when when she? They repeat her scream, don't they? Do you remember that when the car flips? Oh, that does ring a bell. Yeah, she's I like, ah! she's, they repeat the scream. I didn't notice it then, but that does ring a bell. From yeah, all seems a bit weird. <laughs> this is a great moment here because when you see him get out and you see the Terminator take him out, but you, it's seen. By Sarah from a distance, and it looks far more kind of scary. Yeah, like that. You know, it's a her point of view. Yeah, he, he, and handheld again as well. He's, there are a few shots like this that, yeah, that really do depth of field in a kind of unnerving way. The fact that the shot of uh, Reese at the bar in Tech Noir is a bit, a bit similar. I love how they do that in Number Two. Where the T one thousand jumps through the helicopter, and he's like, "Get out!" And then he just goes, "Okay," <laughs> jumps out. But another in T two though, where the the truck's coming because they've stolen that guy's kind of small vehicle, mm. and he's like, he just goes, "Wow!" And he jumps over the the side as T one thousand just charges past <laughs> in that truck, full of uh, what was it? That liquid? I don't know what was it. Full of um, uh, oh god, um, yeah, <laughs> the cold stuff. stuff. The cold stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very cold slushy. <laughs> Liquid nitrogen. That's it. Go. That's it. Yeah. It's a grown up word. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're good at the science. 
Obviously, obviously, they went that that tunnel earlier, the famous tunnel in is it LA, isn't it? It's used in Blade Runner, yeah, and it's used it's in, in uh, Batman as well. So, oh, oh, Batman on. Forever uses it, I think. Yeah, um, Back to the Future Two, maybe. Oh, I can't remember. I can't remember. This gives you that amazing reflection of light, doesn't it? Um, yeah, it's like tiled, maybe. I don't know. It's like when you see the close up of a truck, you can see like a big chunky wire pulling it, like for the model. Yeah. It's always, it's always there in the close up. That's, that's why they had to re. It, it's. I'm watching really closely because I'm always amazed at, at, at the fact this is a model. Oh. But it's also. It was Cameron's so good at like mixing models and live action and front projection. Yeah. That's front projection as she kind of runs and yeah. goes, no, and explodes and like. That's something you always use, like in like using Superman. Um, but the um, like in T two, the opening sequence where you've got in the foreground, you've got the Stan Winston guys kind of animating these massive puppets, and then you've got miniatures shot like run projected on front projection behind them or rear projection. So you've got this kind of mix of different elements yeah. to, in all shot within within camera. It's mad. I Be- love all that stuff because he it's knows just, what he's doing. Yeah, it's not just like oh, we'll just green screen it. And put some CGI Terminators in. Green screen it later. Let's ask the VFX producer what he thinks we should do. I think we should green screen it later. Why is that? Well, because then I get paid. So I've never understood that. All my time in post-production, they had someone on set for all these movies who would they'd go to and say, now, do you think we should do it this way, where we pay someone else, or this way, where we pay you? Mm. The politics and um, of filmmaking... And the uh, <laughs> such a greediness of it all, because no film, like especially with Indiana Jones style Destiny, should cost three hundred million. No bloody way. No, no. Someone's getting a huge paid day out of that, you know. Being well, of overpaid. course they are. And it, you know, so you could have shot Indiana Jones film should be shot for like twenty million. You know, there there should be gritty, low budget, kind of action movies. You know. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the, yeah. There's too many people getting paid too much money there. Uh, but I mean, at the end of the day, you've got. I mean, this is the, the reason it was always given why there was no Indiana Jones four for for so long was between Lucas Spielberg and Harrison Ford. That's three people who are all expecting at least twenty five million in their pocket from this project. So before you even start budgeting to make the thing, you've got perhaps a hundred million you've got to find just for. A few key players, yeah. Uh, that, that's obviously the horror imagery we've seen, you know, from Cameron. You know, just rising up, like because it's so well he's hidden it in that, like, like mess of metal, and it sort of rises up, and uh, and you, you get like when you see like maybe like two, three shots, maybe four of stop motion. Yeah, um, I think the only one that sort of gives it away, like it kind of you could do a little bit more work on, was when it. You see, it's kind of it's going towards the camera, and you can see like the the lights above are a bit stuttery. I, to like, be honest, it, I don't think that. A, a f- yeah, there, there was originally it's like meant this to be one a, here. So the frame rate, yeah, of the of the background is too stuttery. I, yeah, I think so. these these shots are a mistake. To be honest, I also am not a big fan of the, the previous shot of him walking in front of the fire, the the uh, stop motion in front of the fire, and this here is there's bad comping here as well. But then, yeah. You see shots like this, which are obviously a life-size puppet, essentially. Yes. Someone's on someone's shoulders, isn't it? Yeah. And they're, they're completely convincing. And, and a lot of the shots of the stop motion, I'm not convinced you really need the full height of the thing. Or Like when he was walking down the corridor then, it wouldn't have been a huge conceptual change to use the puppet for that. Also, I think there's a bit here, you know, when it bursts through the door, and it's like, where are they? You know, you can see behind them the operator... Oh really? Well. He's, yeah, because it's backlit as well, so you can <laughs> see the operator but just below if you if uh, if you keep an eye out. Come on, open the door, open the door, come on. Yeah, this is this is some pretty scary stuff actually, isn't it? Is he's he's completely screwed now, isn't he? 
He hasn't got much energy left. If you look below, you can see the head. Did we operate that? <laughs> oh, I, I think, I, yeah, it's like a, a shoulder and, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, apparently Stan Winston was uh, originally uh, had to fight hard not to not to have more stop motion. He felt that more could be done with the the puppet. Mm. I think it was that way around rather than the other way around. Because it wasn't the stop motion isn't go motion like what Phil Tippett would kind of you know utilize with things like Ed Two Nine, where you get that a bit more of a smoother um, kind of movement going on. It's hard as well because we've, we're so we're, we I mean we know how the Terminator moves now, so, yeah, so yeah. they're not you know Ed Two O Nine could just be that's how Ed Two O Nine moves, but this has to be like Arnold moves. But I think the way you look at Salvation, where they do a lot of movement with CGI with the with the endoskeleton, it's actually really convincing, and they've, they've really the animators spent a lot of time you know trying to get it to look right yeah. and how it moves and how it jumps down on stuff and this this. Uh, yeah, it's very impressive. I mean, they, they were clever yeah. to to damage his. There's a shot where you actually see what it is. It's like his Achilles tendon that's been disconnected somehow in the crash. So I suppose they're, they're clever to give him a limp, which means his gait and everything's going to be a lot easier to come up with in stop motion and yeah. and like this. And for the operator to sort of move him, and you know, not have to be like, oh, we've got to try and make him move like a human. You know, he doesn't have to now. He's kind of he's being essentially crippled. But he always like you know when he gets the pipe bomb and he sticks it in the terminator, but he puts it like in his um, you know his stomach. But how does he hang it on there? Because it's empty. But obviously it hangs on this kind of invisible wire as it explodes. There's stop motion here, isn't it? And he hits him like that's very. Oh, it still feels a little. There's only one little shot. It's like very Ray Harryhausen moment, you know. You see, uh, personally, I mean, obviously, oh. uh, if I'd been there on set, I'd have explained to Jim what he needed to do. But <laughs> shots like this, personally, I'd have just gone in a bit closer and yeah. used the. But if you told Jim that, he would stare you down. <laughs> wouldn't he? Yeah, like I wouldn't have the nerve to tell James Cameron that. <laughs> yeah, they they really yeah. sold just how flaky that whole <laughs> little sequence is, didn't they? <laughs> I think when the, the the TV cut of the Terminator, I think when she says "You're terminated, fucker," I think she just says "You're terminated too" or something like that. Uh, I can't Cause remember. Because Carl's been terminated, hasn't he? So, um. yeah. So it's yeah. It's after this, isn't it? That, that there are there is that key deleted scene of two Cyberdyne employees. Yeah, no. he finds the chip. They don't shoot it that close because they can. They obviously the chip would change come T two. The, the redesign of it, but the guys like, oh, don't the, the officers don't says don't touch anything at the crime scene. The guys like, oh, okay, and he sort of just wanders off and gives it to the guy yeah. to give to R and D. You know, They're, apparently those two were um, like best mates of some executive, uh, Orion, and oh, when you when you see that, I, I I didn't know that when I first saw that deleted scene, but I rewatched it the other day. And it's really obvious how absolutely terrible they are. They're such bad actors. And Ca ah. Cameron says, or has said, that that's actually why he cut that bit. I don't know if it's true or not, but he essentially cut it because they were just awful. <laughs> oh, this, is, this is like classic horror music now. You know, just like... He ain't giving up. Imagine if you, like, just... You didn't crush him, but you'd like just escape, and he'd spend the rest of his the whatever <laughs> energy he has left just crawling after you for ages, forever. <laughs> that speed, yeah, forever. Yeah. <laughs> but he'd finally catch up to you when you fall asleep. He's like, "Gotcha." <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's coming for you. Oh, his bit where he's on the conveyor belt as well. He's just like. See, I, I can believe that the, these mannerisms of his here are Arnold's. Uh, I can believe that that's Arnold looking around like that. And... 
you don't really get a sense that his teeth are human teeth like but in the design you can see it's kind of this kind of like yeah, pure white point. teeth yeah. they've got him but in this it's kind of looks more like they've darkened it maybe because of the, ex- the explosion um but yeah you don't really get a sense that he's got these kind of human chompers you know it's also i mean if we want to be picky that endoskeleton was covered in human tissue and human flesh a few minutes ago and it's it's incredibly cleanly and evenly burnt <laughs> off now isn't it <laughs> he'd, he'd obviously in real life emerge from that fire with all kinds of melted filth hanging off him and horrible horrible things he's only got, he's only got a thin layer of blood hasn't he <laughs> waffer thin I remember this so clearly from childhood this yeah this, this little sequence st- stuck in your mind isn't it you know this thing getting crushed and also they used like a little bit of a cigarette smoke, you know, and they blew it in front of the um, the close-up of the eye as it sort of powers down. Yeah, I'd, I had, I'd not remembered how long this sequence is from the point of them arriving at, at Cyberdyne to, to this. It's a big chunk of the film. But Carl Reese is like, I think this is a pickup shot with Carl Reese, isn't it? When they put him, they got Michael Bean to lay on the, the bonnet of James Cameron's car. And yeah. Just, like, just shot him just being zipped up in a, you know. In his, in his, in his suit bag. That's, that's yeah. What it was. Cameron, <laughs> it's not a body bag. It's the bag that Cameron kept his suit in. <laughs> that's, that's pretty downbeat. Now, now this pit was supposed to be like, you know, the camera would pan up and you see it was Cyberdyne, but not to be. I do love them doing the end credits where you've got um, uh, a sort of Terminator theme kind of extended, but it has a bit of, like, a bit of like electric guitar to it. I think it's, oh, it's one of my favourite renditions of the theme. Yeah, because Linda Hamilton would return for Salvation only as, a, as an audio component, you know, sort of the extra tapes John oh, Connor has. I because it's, now. it gets to the point where she, he's run out of, like, tapes of what she what she can give him in terms of information because there's nothing about this other Terminator, which is um, Sam Worthington's one, yeah, where it's kind of, of a hybrid, isn't it, you know? I've only seen that once when it came out. I haven't, I've got very few memories of it. You should give it another go. I, it, when I, I didn't particularly like it when it came out. I think the more you watch it, you realise the better it gets. But it's kind of a weird, kind of sequel where it's weirdly forgettable. Mm. Um, a bit like Die Hard Two, I find. You know, it's a weirdly forgettable sequel. Oh, I'm, I'm a fan I, of that. Actually, I know. I, I know. I'm almost alone, but I, I <laughs> really rate Die Hard Two. I prefer it to the third one. What? No. Get out. Like controversial. I always get this reaction. Yeah. Die Hard Three is so much better. I think yeah, I, yeah. It's probably a better film. That I, I, I just I prefer the second one for probably because it, it was you know predates growing up. Basically, I think I was. <laughs> so Die Hard Two, Predator Two, Robocop Two, the Mean Spirited sequels of nineteen ninety. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's have, let's have fun with the 18 rating. You know? yeah, in how many of those movies... Oh, I suppose it's only Predator 2. In how many of those movies is Bill Paxton the first person killed? Because it's, <laughs> it's, it's this one. It's um, Aliens. Yeah. First one killed by an alien in Aliens. First one killed by the Predator in Predator 2. First one killed by the Terminator in this. Or, or attacked, anyway. Attacked, yeah, well, the first Because uh, the other troops all get attacked, don't they, in Aliens? But he gets... Out of the, I don't know, the I sort of recognisable actors. Yeah, yeah, maybe it's, I'm more, I'm more parroting uh, an yeah. oft said bit of trivia. <laughs> I love when she talks to the guy there. He looks so stoned. <laughs> His eyes are so red. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's <just> like... <laughs> that looks more like meth. <laughs> Do 
Do you ever work out, is that meant to be the dog from the last scene, or is it just a different dog? It's probably the same dog. It's, yeah. might, be, might be Cameron's dog. You know. That's a, obviously a nice, finish a nice map painting there. Yeah. There's, yeah, it's only the VHS release onwards that it had the acknowledgement of uh, Oh, um, yeah, Anderson, so this, yeah. Right, so this the one we're watching now is the the original... Well, it's, it's, yeah, it's continued on from all prints would have oh, that. There you go, there it is, yeah. yeah. But it's, it's different, though. It's not the same credit. It's not that. I'm sure the credit on my version plays over the shot of the uh, matte painting rather than over the black screen like that one just did. Oh, well, one of my friends, uh, Nick, at Raven's Film Productions, he did a video and all the home video releases of Terminator, so it's probably explained in there, um, the various sort of transfers of the film. Um, but yeah, again, I like like most of us, you know, uh, the Terminator masterpiece, you know, still works, nothing's wrong with it. Yep. <laughs> you know, um, it's, you know, it, you know, if I was younger, I would, I would very much argue that T2 was better because of all the crazy stunts, visual effects, you know, Arnold, you know, being the good guy. But as a as an adult, it's very much like I love the sort of the film noir, the yeah. horror aspect. There's more, more simple Exa- that's kind of what approach I like. to it. Yeah, I, li- I like yeah. how linear it is. I like how straightforward everything is. I like how scaled down and lo-fi everything is. Yeah. I, I think Terminator 2 is the, it's the better film, obviously, really, and if for no other reason that it, it appeals to a much broader audience. Yes, it does. Yeah, and at the end of the day, movies are you know they're entertainment. It? I, my favorite. I think that I often think the best films are are the ones that they're like everyone likes and and are perfect. A movie like Jaws is is kind of perfect. I think Terminator Two falls into that category, whereas this is a more down and dirty genre movie for genre fans it's a b movie but yes yeah that's what i like yeah 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 and and, and also as you as you know did your your video on it that it spawned so many knockoffs that people saw it like oh we could do this ourselves because it was such a down and dirty yeah. kind of cheap approach but what the, the fundamental thing they were missing was james cameron exactly <laughs> and, this is and the sense of quality control you know this is the thing man if you if you want to really appreciate these movies like this these these key genre classics of our era if you're ever if you're ever wondering if you're ever like drifting away from them and wondering whether they really are that good, just watch imitations of them because that I've found that to be extraordinarily eye opening when it comes to developing a greater appreciation of people like James Cameron and even George Lucas. You know, like Lucas gets a lot of shit and mostly understandably, but a lot of it is also about just ripping off other people's ideas and making you know Star Wars just being a collection of other people's ideas which is kind of true in a way but yeah there were hundreds of people then tried to do the same thing and every one of them failed so yeah. he he knew what he was doing in some way he knew what to do by taking old ideas and modernizing them mm. and making them appeal to everyone at that time and um, and that's one. Well, you could essentially say lightning in a bottle, but he would do a fantastic job of Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. So, but it's, I mean, it's, like, it's like Robocop. You know, it is lightning in a bottle. You know, yeah. it shows you that kind of sequels that fundamentally there's more bad Robocop than good. And the same with, with Terminator now because they made so many so many sequels. Exactly. You know? yeah. It's it's difficult to sort of out of one and two. It's like where else can you go with it? And that's the problem. Yeah, you. Um, he nailed, Cameron nailed both ends of the spectrum with these two movies uh, the, one of which is almost a remake of the other but yeah you know yeah. it's done so differently that it doesn't matter it gets away with it you know and it seems new and refreshing you know well there you go folks that's the end of the commentary hope you enjoyed it i'm sure me and rob will be back to discuss t2 <laughs> but which version of t2 though there's so many different cuts i suppose it, i suppose the most common version is the special edition you know which has um, Michael Bean in it as a flashback, yeah, as a dream yeah. sequence, you know, and all the other little bits and bobs, but not the bit with the ultimate cut where you see John Connor is alive as an adult with his child in the future. Oh, God, yeah, I, I don't, I've only seen that clip actually. I don't think I've actually seen that version of the movie. Oh man, yeah. So it's like the future where it's like a bit like Demolition Man of the future. You know what I mean? It's a so very clean future, you know, with big buildings. Well, folks. That's the end. Take care of yourselves, and goodbye for now. Goodbye for now.